explain the God bless you. Welcome this morning, and uh, warm welcome to those that are joining us online. Um, we may be few in number, but um, <laughs> we're strong in spirit. Amen. 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 Uh, have you got a song for us to read this morning? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Also, good morning to Natty, who's joining us from sunny Scotland. We love you, and thank you for joining us. We read Psalm 91. May we stand. A psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf, and sit in like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth, flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deep give birth, and strips the forest bare. And his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Amen. Amen. Father, we just want to thank you for this morning. We want to thank you. It's the first day of the week. We want to thank you, Father, for those that are here in body and those that are joining us online. We want to pray that you'll be those that are absent this morning, that uh, you're close to them and you're near to them. Amen. Father, I just pray really right now that you fix our hearts, that we fix our hearts on the planet, that we solely think and concentrate and Engage with our Saviour. That you open our minds, open our hearts to your word, to the truth that's in your word. Remind us, Father, of your gospel, of that glorious gospel. Empty us of the things of this world. Take away the worldly things. Just lay them aside. Leave them outside the door. Let's just concentrate and focus on you. Help us to encourage one another. Help us to get alongside one another. And Father, equip us to respond in grace, to respond in amazing grace that you give us. Father, we commit everything to you, to your glory, to your honor, to your grace. Amen. <laughs> Yeah. 
And if you wish to give online, all the ones I want to know online, the Ivan code will be on. If you wish to contribute to the work that we're doing here in Tenerife, that the doors stay open, to pay the rent, the water repairs, whatever there is. But if you would like to give to our mission, um, we support missionaries and MAP UK, please specify it and we transform or even take an envelope if you're here and just write down it's for the work here or for the mission. I also would like to ask you to keep praying um, for our church family members. We have Becky, who's still poorly. Um, we have Matthew, which is poorly. These two weeks gone. And just pray for each other in a daily. And for our pastor, of course, also. Not to forget him. Just pray for so many. <laughs> Sovereign God, to you belongs all the glory, praise, and honor. We worship you, we exalt you, and we say thank you that you will be done here in Tenerife. Thank you so much that we are able to be together, everyone here physically, but also online. Thank you for so many brothers and sisters that you have sent this whole year visiting us. We are ever so grateful. Thank you for everyone that came, that encouraged us. Thank you for everyone that has been giving and is giving for your work, for your kingdom. To you be all the glory and praise and honor. In Christ's name. stand here and speak your word and I pray that as this word comes out of my mouth, that's literally all it is, I'm just the, the messenger, but it's the work, the wonderful work of your Holy Spirit who work within us, within our hearts, within our spirits, as this word it goes into our ears, that you will make it personal to each one of us, including myself, that we may be built up in the faith and leave here stronger than we can be. Knowing more about you, more about your work, more about what you want from us, what you need from us. Our worship, our praise, our adoration, our service, our thanks, our gratitude. To serve you honestly and willingly. For the glory of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're reading uh, in Galatians. We're going through the book of Galatians. Verse by verse, at the moment we're in, um, after 12 weeks, we're in Galatians 3. In Galatians 3, and today we're going to be reading from verses uh, 15 to 18. Just covering them in few verses today. If you have a Bible, if you need a Bible, take a hand up and look at one to you. I don't know about your Bible, but in mine I get these little subheadings, which is always very helpful. It kind of sets the theme for what we're reading. And uh, the New King James says the changeless promise. So at the top of verse 15, the changeless promise. 
I'm reading from uh, Galatians 3, 15 to 18. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant. Yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and your seed, who is Christ. And this I say, that the Lord, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Amen. Amen. So we're going through the book of Galatians, and just to catch you up a little bit, um, Paul, the Apostle Paul, is writing to the churches in Galatia. He's rebuking them. Um, it's a strong letter, it's an angry letter, because they've started to listen to other teachers, they've started to listen to other things, and they've started to go on to another gospel. And he spent many years there, teaching them, guiding them, leading them, nurturing them, and he disappears for just a, what appears to be a few months. And within a short amount of time, they start having tickling ears and listening to other, other things, other, other words, other preachers. And it was the Judaizers that were coming in that were telling them to, they had to start obeying certain Mosaic laws. They should be circumcised. And that um, there was a little bit of what Paul said, but a little bit of what the, the Jewish tradition said. And so Paul is really fighting against this. And because obviously we know that many of these people were converted Jews, that the law would have been second nature to them in many ways, or the keeping of the law. Their parents, their grandparents, their, their great, 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 great grandparents would have all been keepers of the law. And Paul himself, we know, was the most zealot of zealots in, in, in his Judaism. So he knew the word, he knew the scriptures, yet he was able, through this knowledge that he had, to be able to use that to come back to, to what was going on. And he opens the verse with brethren. This is really interesting because brethren, this is, this is now brothers, as we would say in, in modern day language. Um, it's the first time in, in this letter that Paul has used the term brothers because he starts the letter off with you foolish Galatians and all the way through this letter he's been banging home you know come on guys don't be stupid use your use your minds and now he's he's turning the conversation brothers brothers it's now personal it's, it's, it's this is now much more warmer and it carries the sense that he's appealing to them so he's gone in and he's gone you fools you you've followed this you've done this don't you realize he's gone through all this and now he's come to the point where he's going, basically, guys, listen to me. Listen. Sit and listen to me a minute. Consider this. It's much more personal. He says, I speak in the manner of men, meaning he's humanly speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, he's, this is no high, high language, no, no high anything. He's using human logic. And he he's now starts to use an illustration from from everyday life, and, and we all know that when we're trying to get across something to someone, it's good to sometimes find an illustration that we can use to help that. So Paul's now offered up another case or another argument, but it's based on the similarity between man's testament and God's testament. As Christians, biblically, we are to prove earthly things by heavenly things. Amen? Mm -hmm. Not heavenly things by earthly things. Sola Scriptura. Right? Mm -hmm. So, the Bible is the authority, not man's word. Yeah, we've got that. We understand that. The Bible is all authority, not man's word. So, anything that man says, it needs to be proved through Scripture. That is how we live as Christians. 
this is why we don't accept certain things that have been put onto us. Let's say, for example, the theories, of which there are many, of evolution. They are theories, they are not proven facts. But scientists will present them as a fact. They are not facts, they are unproven. But we have the proven word of God that tells us of how creation came about. And that has authority over God's word. Authority of God's word over men's word comes every time. It trumps the man's word thing. So Paul's argument, what he's saying here basically is civil law, which is God's ordinance, prohibits tampering with any testament of man. Okay? Any person's last will, for example, if you write your last will, it's called the last will and testament, yeah? When you write your last will, your, your, your will. It can't be tampered with afterwards. Once you're dead, that's it. Yeah? So you open up the last will and testament, it stands. No one can change it, can they? No one can annul it. No one can say, well, that's not what it meant. They read it out. Whether you like it or not, that's what you get. Yeah? That's what you get. So that's the last one. This is basically what he's trying to say. Paul's, where he says this, it, it's got to be respected. The last, a person's last will and testament has to be respected. And Paul writes that he's speaking in the manner of men. In other words, he's kind of saying, I'll give you an illustration from the customs of men. If a man's last will is respected, and it is, how much more ought to be the testament of God respected and honoured? You see, he is basically referring back to what he said in the previous verse, where he mentioned uh, the conversation with Abraham. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So he's referring back to that. When Christ died, this testament, this testament, was sealed in his blood. After his death, the testament was opened, as it would be, on anyone's death, and now it's been published to the nations. Christ himself said, it is finished. No more to add. Nothing else to add to it. It's complete. We don't need other people to tell us, God said, God said, God told me, God this, God that. It's finished, it's complete, it's all in the book. It's, it's done. We don't need anything or anyone to add to it. What anyone wants to add to it, they're trying to add to the testament. And we can't do that. So this is what Paul's trying to get across. It is finished. No man must alter God's testament. And this is what these false apostles will do today. And this is what false apostles were doing then. And this is what false apostles have been doing for years and years and centuries. But no man can alter God's testament by substituting the law and traditions of men for the testament of God. We see this most commonly in Roman Catholicism. They have the Bible, yes, but they also have their own book, the Apocrypha, yeah? Because there's certain laws and traditions that aren't in the Bible that they want them to follow, so they made their own one. They've added to the word of God. That's what it is. It's an addition. It is not. And we all know, if we look into Catholicism just a tiny bit, it is a faith of works. Mm -hmm. It is a faith of keeping the law. And this is exactly what Paul was talking to the Galatians about. The law mm -hmm. is finished. As the false prophets tampered with the God's testament in the days of Paul, Many tamper with the testament of God today. They may observe certain human laws meticulously, but the laws of God they disregard without the blink of an eyelid. And by the time they come, when the time comes, they'll find it's no joke to pervert the testament of God. It amazes me with the people, some of the people that pervert the testament of God and they're still alive. Now God hasn't struck them down in there. I'm not going to call them a pulpit because I wouldn't even put it that far. But our God hasn't struck some of these people down. Um, uh, uh, just <laughs> confirms to me he's merciful. How merciful he really is. And how patient he really is. Because some of these people are perverting God's word uh, to the point of, well, more than heresy. 
The heart of this point that Paul is making is to show that the covenant with Abraham, because he's going back to that, was an unconditional covenant of promise relying solely on God's faithfulness. Whereas, in comparison, the covenant with Moses, which is the law, was a covenant of law relying on man's faithfulness. So, in a nutshell, to Abraham God said, I will, and to Moses God said, Thou shalt, you will. That's the covenant, yeah? I will, you will. And we know the story, don't we? We know how well that went. They had problems, didn't they? Keeping the testament, keeping the law, and as we all do. The promise set out a religion that was dependent on God. The law set out a religion dependent on man. So God promises what he promises, and man is supposed to keep his side of the bargain, yet we know he doesn't. The promise centers on God's plan, God's grace, God's initiative, God's sovereignty, God's blessings. The law centers on man's duty, man's work, man's responsibility, man's behavior, man's obedience. The promise was grounded in grace and requires only, what, sincere faith. The law, grounded in works, demands what? Perfect obedience. You can't break one law, which we saw in our speech, 613. Hard work to keep that up every day. Paul asserts that it's common knowledge that when a man makes a contract, and that contract is once agreed upon, it cannot be modified or exchanged. It can't be changed except by mutual consent of both parties to the contract. For example, if one's dead, he can't agree to a change, can he? And I think we understand that in the, in the times that this was written, they took their word and they took their contract seriously. It's not like we do today. But they were very serious. In Eastern times, in that part of the world, a contract was a contract and it was binding. So it was, it was a very strong thing. So this is where Paul's coming from. He's basically saying, look at the contract. Look at, look at the terms and conditions. You've got the terms and conditions of the law. Keep the law. Or you've got the terms and conditions of faith. Believe. What one do you want to take? You can't have both. And he appeals, implies this, uh, implies this that God's covenant with Abraham, contending that the law cannot modify it, considering it was given centuries later. I think this is something that we tend to overlook. We might read the Bible every year. We might sometimes do Bible studies into into the Old Testament and things. But I think sometimes, for sure it was for me, a long time before I realised the promise was given to Abraham way, way, way before Moses was about. Because we read it linear. So we read Abraham and then Moses popped along. Well, it was 300 odd years before Moses came into the same. Um, and we know, don't we, that before that there was no law. So how can you break the law if there is no law? We went through that the other week as well. So Paul's using the truths that all men knew regarding covenants, that men made with other men. And here he makes a crucial statement that no one can add conditions to a legally validated human covenant. So the point is pushing that even if men who are sinful hold to their covenants to be binding and unchangeable once they were signed and sealed, how much more so should we hold on to the covenant we have? In verse 16 he says, and he brings up again, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and your seed, who is Christ. Now, now to Abraham. When God made the covenant promise with Abraham, he promised him a seed. A seed through which many nations will be blessed. A seed. One seed. That seed is the Messiah. That's Christ. And he said that through that seed, the nations of the world will be blessed. That was the promise. Does God break his promises? No. We can read this in Genesis 22, verse 18. This is the actual verse that Paul was quoting. In your seed and the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have what? Obeyed my voice. 
obeyed my voice. The only thing he had to do was obey the voice, the same as we had to do. Not the law, because there was no law. Obey his voice. All we have to do is to obey his voice. How does God speak to us today? Not through prophets, not through people telling me that God told you that you've got to do this. God speaks to you through his word. Through his word, that's how he speaks to us. That's how he's always spoken to us. And that's how he speaks to us today. So we obey his voice. So the promise that God made to Abraham was actually the promise of salvation. He promised the Messiah. The coming Messiah who would, who would liberate them. Not the, the liberator that, that some of the Jews were looking for. Justification would be made available to both the Jews and the Gentiles. How could it not be? How could that not include the Gentiles? All the nations. All the nations were not Jewish, were they? We knew that. They knew that. So, all the nations. And just as Abraham entered that covenant of faith, we too are descendants of Abraham. And likewise, we have entered that covenant of faith. You and me. When we believe. When we have faith to believe. That's it. There is no laws to keep. There is no rules to keep. Obviously, there's moral laws and things and stuff that's written in the Bible that we need to pay attention to. But not the laws as the laws of the 613 laws and the ceremonies and cutting pigeons in half and all that stuff. You and me. The fact that the promise was made to Abraham and to all believers down the ages in follow Abraham in his act of faith indicates clearly that the faith way of salvation existed before the law was given. So faith was before the law. How can the law nullify faith? It can't. It can't. Because the covenant can't be changed. Therefore, the entrance of the law did not affect the covenant at all. Because the promises were made to both Abraham and his descendants, they did not become void when Abraham died, or when the law came centuries later. It didn't nullify anything. The promises were made in view of Christ, one seed, the singular, not seeds. Christ alone fulfilled the messianic aspects of God's covenant and showed that God's promises are in effect for all time. And many may have claimed to be rightful heirs to God's promises to Abraham by being their offspring. We was of Abraham, we are sons of Abraham, blah, blah, blah. We know all that one. But here Paul points out that the only true rightful heir is Jesus. They may have claimed to be of Abraham, but the only rightful heir of the seed was Jesus. And Paul has made that clear. He writes it out. And to your seed, who is Christ? He's put it there. He's written it for him. Paul, remember, knew these scriptures. Yeah? He was a Jew of the Jews of the Jews of the Jews. But he could quote scripture, bang, bang, bang. And he knew exactly now what this meant since he'd been saved. The covenant that God shared with Abraham had been reaffirmed many times, but only Christ fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant as the unique seed. So we know that the Jews probably, and we know they certainly enjoyed many privileges, and responsibilities as part of the Abrahamic covenant, but the blessing of the nations was the Messiah's role. So they may have received all the blessings of being Abraham's children. They may have enjoyed some benefits, but the Messiah was the one who would bless the nations. In and through Christ, only, only, Christ is our hope. Christ is our blessing. We have had an earlier promise where the singular use of seed also refers to Christ. In the Garden of Eden. Remember that one? Let's turn to it quickly. It's on the screen anyway. In Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, singular, referring to her seed, shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. The one and only heir of every promise is God. It's Christ. 
every promise given in the covenant with Abraham was fulfilled in Jesus Christ and only in Jesus Christ. Therefore, the only way a person can participate in the promised blessings of Abraham is to be a fellow heir with Christ through faith. And that's where we are today. We have faith in him. We have faith in Christ. So we then receive the blessings of the faith in Christ. The blessings of Abraham, of all nations, be blessed. That's us. We're there. Now Paul makes a statement of fact and he speaks about the length of time that elapsed between the giving of the covenant to Abraham and the giving of the law to Moses. Verse 17. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. That is what he's saying. It can't change anything. Here he's saying that the law was something new and different, but it could not make any changes to what the way been promised. God was saving men on the basis of faith without works since the time of Adam, yeah? Because we can read it, can't we? So it's spanned of about two and a half thousand years before, before Abraham, before the law was given. So that period of time, God was saving men on faith. He had faith in God, kept his word. He was, they were still very saved. So how much clearly can, can Paul now illustrate that Adam was saved by faith? 430 years before the law came into effect. It's a fact. It's a, it's a, it's a written historical fact. So he's now said that to them. Well, then refute this. Abraham was blessed, yeah? Yeah? And all, this, the, all the nations will be blessed to receive, yeah? yeah? So not for the law. No, no, no. But the law wasn't until 430 years later. So why are you saying that? You've got to keep the law and not faith. Grace is superior to law. The whole point here is to ensure that the Galatian churches are fully aware of the incorrect teachings that were being pressed upon them. And Paul is continually hitting them with facts that they were being influenced. And he was completely and continually telling them that we are saved by faith alone and not by works and not by tradition, traditions of any type. Faith alone. How do we know that? That's a question, isn't it? It comes up sometimes. How do we know that a person is justified by faith alone? Especially now in the world that we live in, we all expect him to do things, yeah? Because we read what Paul's writing to the Galatians. Simple as that. How do we know? Because God gave his covenant of faith before he gave the law. Simple. You don't have to come up with any big argument. God gave his covenant of faith before he gave the law. We're not of the law, we're of faith. That's it. You're justified. Justification by faith. The covenant of faith preceded the covenant of law. You can use that term in your When the law was given, the promise of Abraham had not yet been fulfilled. Therefore, the law can't change it or void it because it hasn't been fulfilled yet. So God gave his promise and God doesn't break his promises. And God won't give a promise and then change it when the law comes to us. Amazing. And this is what Paul is really pushing across to them. Also, we see that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. We see that in John 1 17. Since Christ Jesus, who is eternal, also existed before Abraham covenant of faith was given to Christ even before it was given to Abraham. Christ was before Abraham, yeah? So he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was saying. He knew the promise he was making. If you believe in the sovereign God, if you believe in, in the truth that's in the Bible, then Christ was before Abraham. Christ was before Moses. Christ was before the Lord. So the promise is before the law. The promise was before time began. The promise of your salvation was promised before you was even a twinkle. The covenant made with Abraham was to inform mankind how to follow God and receive the promise that is by faith. 
So the point is clear, what Paul is making, and he's really trying to get this across because as he's said already, you foolish Galatians, and now he's sitting there or trying to appeal to them as the brothers, listen to me. He's saying, look, can't you see this? Abraham has promised to fall the law. Do you get it? Do you get it? The point is clear, no man is justified by the law, that is, by self-effort or, or trying to become good and righteous by obeying any laws. And that was not the purpose of the law. A person is justified by faith and faith alone. We've got to remember as well when we read this, the backdrop of this letter to the Galatians, many of which were converted Jews. But think about it. Among them would have also been family members of the Pharisees and the Zealots or the zealot mentality that had stirred up trouble to crucify Christ. Also remember that in these times, if you come out of the Jewish faith, you was cast as an outcast. You'd lose your job. You'd lose your friends. You'd lose your standing. You'd lose going to the shops and saying hello to people. They would ignore you. People would walk past you on the street. You was classed as filthy, unclean, dirty, rotten, scoundrel, nasty person that had turned your back on God to follow a new teaching. I guess they might have even referred to it in them days as new age. You know, you don't know, really, but they would have seen it in a similar similar vein. All of a sudden, all the traditions were you were leaving them behind to follow this Christ, this Messiah, who died, because that's most of the message they got. They didn't like the next bit, but he rose again. Because they crucified him. Yeah. And they didn't like the truth when it came and stared them in the face. So everything about their way of life would have changed. They would have not no longer been accepted. And that's us really. Yeah. When you stood up and made your declaration of faith in front of your friends and family, you probably had a few people nodding, oh, that's nice for you. Maybe other people will say, well, oh, don't talk to me about all that Jesus stuff. I don't want to know. And you put it on Facebook and they unfriend you or whatever. Well, so what, whatever. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. We saw last week how Paul directed them back to the scriptures in Deuteronomy 27. I'll read it to you where it says, Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of the law by observing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. Amen means so be it. All the people agreed. <coughs> so, you're cursed if you don't keep all the law. Yeah. And they didn't keep all the law. <laughs> but, so now they're condemned by the law. The Israelites were obligated to obey the law and fully agree to it. In its entirety. Including all of its ceremonial and civil aspects, all of it. Deuteronomy 5:33 says, "You shall walk in all the way which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land you will possess." Wow. So here, the Lord is obligated to bless or curse. Israel, depending on how way they're dead in their heart, but the bargain, well, obviously, we know that we Israel failed time and time and time and time and time again. Moses goes up the mountain to get the law. What do they do? They build a false idol and start worshiping it. That's just one of them. He delivered them out of the hands of Egypt. What did they do? Complain, moan, whinge. Better mm, lose in Egypt. Better lose in Egypt. Covenant with Abraham, on the other hand, was a one-sided covenant. The Lord obligated himself to bless Abraham and all who came into faith in the Lord unconditionally. So Israel says, we will, but God says, I will. I'd rather go with the God one than the, the Israel one. The Abrahamic covenant was, and he is unilateral, it's one-sided. Because God made the promise to himself. Wow. wow. It was eternal and is eternal. 
It does and it did provide everlasting blessing. It was and it is irrevocable. It's binding. It will never cease. It was and it is still unconditional in that it's dependent upon God and not upon man. That is the peace that we have. Verse 18, Paul continues. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise. It's not a boast. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. The word for at the beginning indicates that Paul's argument is now given reasons for his previous statements, yeah? So you say, well, that for? It's the way that the terminology way we speak. If the inheritance is based on law, it will be the payment of the debt and not the faithful fulfilment of a promise. They're two different things. Two totally different things. And Paul is really saying here, you can't let it both ways. Remember we sat down with the brothers, you know, Paul, hey, explain with this, the law, hand off, the, the promise. Hey, what do you want? You can't let it both ways. You can't let it both ways. You can't have the law way, and you can't have the promise way. You cling to one, you exclude the other. That's it. The law, when added to a promise, destroys salvation by grace through faith in Christ. Salvation must rest either on promise or on the law. It's impossible to mix the two. You can't mix the two. Therefore, if, as the Judaizers were saying, the inheritance is on the basis of law obedience, then it's not on the basis of a promise. That means our faith today is pointless because we live on the promises of God and not on keeping the law. I don't even about that one. The Judaizers quoted Moses, but Paul quoted Abraham. Come before. They quote law, he quotes promise. If they appeal to the centuries of tradition and the proud history of, of the law of Moses, he will appeal to the greater covenant with Abraham that is older by many centuries. And Paul adds, God gave it to Abraham on the basis of promise. It's a promise. The word inheritance we see there in English. In the original Greek, is if I can pronounce it properly. Kleimonomia. It means a given inheritance. It means property received. It means to be given a possession. What word has been used there a few times? Given. It is a gift. A gift is given. So, Kleimonomia, the inheritance that you've received, was given to you. You did not earn it. You did not work for it. You did not pay for it. You did not keep any laws for it. That inheritance was given to you. How was it given to you? Through the promise. This is why we need to read our Bibles and understand. This is why we need to see that, sadly, so many other faiths are going the works way. But we've received an inheritance. It's been given to you. If someone gives you a car, you don't go and buy another one, do you? No. <laughs> someone gives you a house, you don't go and buy another one. Be grateful to that person that gave. But God's given you a new life. God's given you an inheritance of eternity. And why on earth would I want to do something else to gain that inheritance of what it be given? That's a no-brainer. Doesn't make sense. We quickly turn to First Peter. Um, let me flip to First Peter one. I'll put it on the screen if you like, but it's First Peter one three and five. This is the Apostle Peter writing, and he uses the same word. Thank God I'm here. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, from the dead to a clay on the mere, yeah, inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are being kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So you have received an inheritance which is incorruptible, undefiled, it will not fade away, it's reserved for you in heaven, and you are kept by the power of God through your faith for salvation. Praise God. There you go, you've got another writing there in First Peter that underlines that. An inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, it cannot be taken away from you. Last will and testament, it cannot be altered. It cannot be annulled. God made a promise, God will keep his promise. God gave you a gift, he will not remove that gift. God keeps his promise to Abraham, he has not revoked it. And thousands of years have passed. He saved Abraham through what? By his faith. And he blessed the world today through Abraham by sending the Messiah his one seed to, as one of Abraham's many descendants. Circumstances may change, but God remains constant. God does not break his promises. He promised to forgive us our sins through Jesus Christ we can be sure that he will do that forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So let's come to the conclusion in the application because we always need, I think we've seen quite a few things in it, but we need to find things in the Word of God to, to apply to our lives, the, the, the everyday application of his Word. Otherwise it's just uh, nothing. These truths we know are just as much in effect today. We know that they are in effect today. But sadly, we also know that so many faiths will encourage, or enforce even, their followers to obtain justification by works. They also then, they carry a threat. Normally, it's a threat of fear, isn't it, with most faiths? To double down. To double down on these works and repay. When Paul was writing this letter to the Galatians, the Judaizers were, were losing their influence. They were panicking. All their traditions, all their prestige, all their pride, all their, what they thought was favour with God was starting to disintegrate. Their faith was becoming a mess. The Christian church was growing. The Christian faith was growing. They were seeing signs and wonders and miracles through the apostles, but they weren't seeing in their Jewish law keeping. And they were getting upset and getting angry. They didn't like it. Jewish believers now were starting to accept a faith that required no rituals, that required no laws, that required no ceremonies, and more to the point, horror of horror to the Jewish people, everyone is welcome now. Everyone, the Samaritans, oh, Romans, oh, they were getting saved, Cornelius, remember? People were getting saved from different races, and they were coming into the churches, and they were eating together. And they were praying together. And they were sharing things together. And they were seeing signs and wonders and healings. But God must be at work. And now, to them, oh, we've got to do something. We've got to do something about, about our traditions and our culture and our laws. We've got to keep it. Yeah, it was falling away. Quick search on the, on the internet the other day. Just a few of the popular worldwide faiths that, that are around today, and this is up until I think 2019, 2020, one of them was. As of today, practicing Orthodox Jews, there is about 15.2 million keeping the law. That's right. 15.2 million. Another famous uh, or well-known faith we know for law keeping obviously is the Roman Catholics. Today there's an estimated 1.2 billion practicing 
Roman Catholics uh, are keeping law, keeping traditions, keeping hold of what you're told to do. Do this, do that, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. As of December 19, uh, 2020, the Church of the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, we know them as, they have approximately 16.7 million faithful men and women keeping their laws. Remember Mormons, Smith, got the book given to him by an angel and then lost it, as you would. But he's got 16.7 million followers following him. Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't like calling them Jehovah's Witnesses. First of all, just witnesses, but keeping the law, yeah? They've been known to keep the law. 8.6 million active members in the Jehovah's Witnesses. And if we consider even our own faith, the Christian faith, because we know the Church of England, for example, and established churches, which will class as Orthodox, is 260 million. Keeping salvation through the works. I've got a quick maths, and if I've got it right, that's 1,515,700,000 people today that are walking down the wall road. Not the narrow gap. They are the people we need to pray for. 1 billion, five hundred, fifteen million, seven hundred thousand as of today, let alone what's gone on in the past. That as far as we can see, are destined to hell. And as the Judaizers went to stir up fear by confusing people and had a desire to enforce laws, these faith also use fear as a tool. Not keeping the law leads to punishment, remember? Leads to judgment. And possibly loss of your salvation. That's what they're told. Keep the sacraments of the church. Pray to this island. And this is your people. And today, sadly, even in some Christian evangelical, Protestant, Pentecostal churches, the use of fear is to correct. I'll use one that you've probably heard, you may have even had it said to you. You'll lose your salvation. I had that said to me. You'll lose your salvation. Puts fear in you, doesn't it? So what does that fear do? It makes you think you've got to work harder, you've got to do something else. Yeah. You can't lose your salvation. It's a gift. God gave you the gift of salvation. You just read it there, okay? That's how you want to be on. It's inheritance. You cannot lose your salvation. If you're saved, genuinely saved, God is not going to take it back because you've been naughty. He's not going to say, well, that's it, you know. The speed limit says 120, you went 123, fine. Salvation gone. He's not going to do that, is he? Ah, that's been used so many times in the church. Mm -hmm. Well, you've used this salvation. You need to get up under the blood, brother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that one, yeah? Mm -hmm. You need to get up under the blood. You need to spend some time. You need, to, you need to spend some time fasting. Works. Fear and works. And that's what works does. That's what law really does. It puts fear in you. And people will say, especially in the Pentecostal church, well, that's the fear of God. No, that's not the fear of God. The fear of God is his awesomeness. The fear of God would be like if you walked into, well, magnify it a million times, but if you was to walk, walk into a king's office, you know, someone who holds a highly stable position, you're going to be in a, in a, a sense of awesome fear. Yeah. So the fear of God isn't the fear of wrath, it's the fear of his awesomeness. I mean, when, when they came to, to arrest Jesus, 
And they said, who is Jesus? And he said, I am he. They were thrown on the ground. Not because of he'd done anything. It's simply the fear that he is God. And that's what's going to happen. That's the fear of God, not the fear that you're going to get punished. We struggle sometimes with that, I think, because it's been talking to us. And it was, I just heard Brian this morning saying that things have changed since I've like waking up from a full sleep. Well, and it's, then it makes you angry. Because you think, oh, how did I get so fooled? Why did they do that to me? Why did I do that to them? But hey, you're right Praise God, you're right And that's the great, that's the good news. Because really, before that, myself and most of us included, were keeping some form of law. Do this, do that, go there, go here, say that, say this, say that, go that, read this, read that, do that. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't go here. It's like, oh. Where's the freedom in Christ? You know? Where's the freedom? And then you wake up justified through faith because I believe in his word. That's it, that's it. They didn't give me a license to kill or anything like that, but it, that's the regenerate part, that's the regenerate Amen. soul. You suddenly understand the peace of God that transcends all understanding. It becomes real. It becomes real. That, that scripture that you've known so many times becomes real. The scripture, Jesus said, come unto me with every lady and I will give you rest. That becomes real. It becomes real. It's not, you could do nothing. He's promised and he's given. That's it. If you're one that wrestles with eternal security like that, because I know it's been said many times to, to people in the churches, that if you really wrestle and think that you can lose your salvation, then read your Bible. Read the words. Just sit there and allow the Holy Spirit to remind you that covenant, that promise was made. You inherited it. You didn't work for it, you didn't earn it, you don't deserve it. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. Amazing grace. And my favourite one, irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. I can't resist certain foods. If I see it, I'm going to get it. And grace was the same. Irresistible. I couldn't turn away from it. God's covenant. Especially the Abrahamic, and then uh, he made it to you. God initiated the covenant, and he is obligated to himself to keep it. He said that. What more can you do? Nothing. Nothing. And this is the whole point of Paul's argument in Galatians. And this is why it's so important for us to read the Word of God and to understand the Word. Because this is what's written in there. This is what it's all about. This is the history. And history, you can't change history, it happened. When you were saved by grace, through faith in Christ, God's Spirit took you forever out of your old position, which was, we say, in Adam, and transferred you into a permanently new position in Christ. In the new covenant with him in oneness with him, in union with him, and I don't like the word much, but it's written there because they use it now for loads of other stuff, in identity with him and in communion with him. This is a supernatural divine bond that is a covenant that can never be broken, can never be dissolved, can never be altered. You are eternally secure in Christ. Get that into your heart. Get that into your spirit. Get that into your soul because this is what Paul was pushing across. You do not need to do anything else to win your salvation. He has done it all. It is finished. You are eternally secure in Christ. Your eternal security is not dependent on your faithfulness. We all know bad days, don't we? When we have good days and bad days. We all know that. Days when we're super holy. 
and days when we were super saving. We all have them days. But that's not dependent on your salvation. Our dependence is upon the faithfulness of the unchanging, omnipotent, omnipresent, non lying God. He made a promise. He, will keep it. he proved it to his son Jesus Christ. He proves it through the word. He proves it time and time again. So, maybe this is speaking to someone who had fear or you tell them that you can lose your salvation. Well, that is unscriptural, it's unbiblical. And there you have the scriptures to go back to. If someone ever comes up and says that, say, it's not true. If you're a true believer in Christ, you will not lose your inheritance. Amen. Amen. Father, I just want to thank you for your word this morning and, and the truth that's in your word and, and the depth of the truth that's in your word. And I have to wonder how many times that we've read over these passages, we've read over Galatians probably 30 times in my lifetime. Yet you've put diamonds in there that need just a little bit of moving the dirt and the mess out of the way to see the truths the real truths, your truths. You've run it all down for us you, you, and through the centuries it's been kept, preserved. We know that your word is an authority and it's on your word in which we stand. And we thank you for that. The wonderful truths that we have, the promise, your promise, will never be broken. The new covenant will not be broken. Christ is the promise. Christ is the promise. And we, in faith, through faith, by faith, receive that promise. To the glory of his name. Amen. 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 Let's stand and receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine down upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. And goodbye. God bless to everyone who joined us online this morning. And all those that are in their sit beds and falling and trying to get well through. Amen. <laughs>